So, good evening, friends. Here we are once again, reading the Gospel of Mark again. I am Father David Neuhaus at the Jesuit Institute in South Africa. Always happy to be with you. This is the 12th of our 12-part series. Again, what we will be doing is looking at two different texts. I will read them, and then there will be time for me to comment 45 minutes, around 45 minutes, and then we'll have a time for comments and questions. And thank you once again to Ursula, who is here with me, helping me to deal with the questions. As always, um, I remind you that the questions and comments can be written into the chat, and you can do that while we're going through the text. Again, we will begin with a moment of prayer. The Teze chant, Jesus, remember, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so, once again, we remind ourselves that Mark, the book that he wrote, is a carefully composed first century Greek language, literary, spiritual, and theological text inspired by the scriptures of Israel, based upon the life of Jesus of Nazareth, following the writings of Paul of Tarsus, the first of the books of the gospel and a source for the other books. 
And we look once again at the structure. Where have we reached? So the title, the opening, the introduction, the first day. And here we are, five episodes, the beginning of the opposition. Opposition to Jesus, the newness that has broken into the world. Let's look once again at those five episodes. A few weeks ago, we dealt with the introduction, the story of the curing of the leper. And now we have been working through, not in order, but according to the structure, the five episodes of opposition that Jesus faces in Galilee. The first was the paralytic carried in by his friends, let down through the roof. Today, we will deal with the second, Levi, and the feast in his house. Third, the question of fasting, we dealt with that last week, with the center focused on that parable that describes the relationship between the new and the old. The fourth, plucking grain on the Sabbath. We will deal with that also tonight. And finally, the peak of the opposition, the man with the withered hand, when they decide to go out and destroy Jesus. Again, what we said was that there is a structure here, and we link together the narrative number one and narrative number five. Then we dealt with the center. Tonight, we want to spend a bit of time on the second and fourth narratives, Levi and the feast in his house and plucking grain on the Sabbath. Let's plunge into the first narrative. <clears throat> so here we read. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So a complex narrative. As you see, I pointed out something that I'll say just in passing. When Jesus calls Levi saying, follow me, Levi gets up. And I put the word in Greek there because it's interesting to notice that that will also be the, the, the word used for Jesus' own resurrection, the Anastas. I don't want to particularly focus on that, but I do want to point out that here we have, in fact, two parts to this narrative. We have the calling of Levi, not something new. We've seen Jesus calling disciples, and we'll look at that in a moment. And the second part of the narrative is the dinner in Levi's house, which is an occasion for the expression once again of opposition, this being the second narrative of opposition. So let us look firstly at the point about disciples. Yes, Jesus has called a new disciple. For those of you who are keeping count, this would be the fifth disciple. Remember, a first narrative of calling disciples there at the Sea of Galilee occurred right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he arrives in Galilee after having baptized, after having been baptized. And there it is written in chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Come after me, and I will make you fishermen of people. And immediately they left their nets and went with him. 
Okay, so what we have there, and we stressed it, and it will be an element in today's vocation story as well, the immediacy of the response. Jesus, this newness, enters into their life, and they immediately take up the call and follow him. That narrative was followed immediately by a second narrative, making it, in fact, a double narrative, a double indicating the intensity of what is being communicated. As Jesus went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and came to him. So here we have a second vocation story, but of course there is a mounting intensity, whereas the first left their nets, the second leave their father with the hired men and go after Jesus. And tonight we have another vocation story, a fifth disciple being called. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Levi is a tax collector, not a fisherman. But of course, the parallel is in the immediacy of Levi's response, getting up and following Jesus. Last week, we spoke a lot about the new and the old, the new that breaks into the world. And so, as opposed to the opposition to Jesus, the disciples are those who embrace the new, the willingness to immediately respond to the new that comes into their lives and respond positively by getting up and following Jesus. The fishermen become fishers of men and women. So what they were in the past is transfigured as they use what, uh, what capacities they have to now walk with Jesus and um, contribute to his mission. The tax collector, and I'm sure some of you will identify where I took this from, the tax collector, Levi, becomes the accountant of Jesus' mission. Of course, according to tradition, he will be writing things down so that they can be put in order and presented as a narrative. You all remember, of course, that in Matthew's book of the gospel, Levi takes on the name Matthew. And of course, we identify him with the evangelist. For those who want a cryptic, uh, the, the code to that cryptic comment, some of you will know where I got that from. Of course, it's a little inspired by the chosen and the beautiful presentation there of Matthew, who in Mark's gospel is called Levi. But, and there is a huge but, Yes, the disciples are embracing the new. They are responding. But that response to the new is not a one-time thing. And as we've already pointed out in previous lectures, in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, we are still far from the center. The disciples become the opponents. Here we might compare them to the opposition, but there will come a time especially when the going gets tough, when Jesus does not uh, fulfill their expectations of a tri triumphant Messiah, the disciples will be more and more hesitant, becoming, in fact, obstacles to Jesus's mission. So again, that embracing of the new, embraced with immediacy at the beginning, becomes more and more problematic as we move through the Gospel of Mark, again, my belief is that Mark is really writing about us and our struggle to embrace the new. There is a second aspect that I'd like to talk about, and that is, what is the subject of the opposition? Let's go back. The opposition, the scribes of the Pharisees, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? They look with, with disgust in what Jesus is doing. And Jesus answers, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. In fact, in order to be saved, we must recognize our sinfulness 
At least I believe that is what is behind this part of the text. And I think once again, Mark is inspired by his great teacher, Paul. And for that reason, I'd like to read a short text from the epistle to the Romans. Let's go there. Sinner, loved by God. And it's the end of a very powerful chapter in the epistle to the Romans, our chapter 7, which talks about that war that is going on inside of me, an I that Paul is presenting. Uh, that I that knows what I should do, I know, but I am unable to do it because there is a rebellion in myself. Let's read what he writes at the end of this chapter. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. The members there, of course, are the parts of my body, my hands, my legs, everything that I am carnally in the flesh. And Paul then says, wretched man that I am. Many read this as autobiographical. I think it's anthropological. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Now, I think what is essential here and why it ties up with the Marker narrative is the recognition that I am a sinner. I need to pass through that. Those who think that they are righteous, Jesus did not come for them, meaning they have no salvation. They think that they can save themselves, but they don't recognize themselves as sinners. So wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death is a recognition of the human person as a person. And Paul ends the chapter with this exclamation, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. And why thanks be to God through Jesus Christ? Because Jesus has come to heal that inner tear. It's very interesting. You see here, I've put a painting of Caravaggio, which is the calling. Caravaggio calls it the calling of Matthew. You see there Matthew seated at the tax collector's table and Jesus there in the darkness a little, holding out his hand to Matthew saying, come, come and follow me. And Matthew pointing to himself and saying, me, me. And here I think is that moment of recognition that I need to be saved. In fact, I go back to 2013 when Pope Francis presented himself. Someone said, who are you? And he said, I am a sinner whom the Lord has looked upon. I think again, it's this dual, wretched man that I am. I'm a sinner. I don't want to be, but I am. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, the Lord has looked upon, looked upon me as sinner. And then uh, the Pope chose as his motto uh, a three words in Latin, miserando atque eligendo, by having mercy and by choosing him. This is taken from a homily of Bede the Venerable for the Feast of St. Matthew. Again, I think that that is actually what Jesus is saying. I've come for those who recognize themselves as sinners, meaning everyone is a sinner, but not everyone recognizes himself as a sinner. Again, the opposition and the inability of Jesus to reach them, to bring them into relationship with him. That was the second narrative of opposition. Let's look now at the fourth narrative of opposition, and then we will have completed the five narratives. So, the fourth one. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did 
when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food, he entered the house of God when Aviatar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, we notice the dynamic, a dynamic we've discussed, and that is they do not engage with Jesus about what Jesus is. They are engaging with Jesus, finding fault with the disciples. And so Jesus, again, is trying to bring them around. Now, let's go through some aspects of this text. First of all, I'm not going to try and explain, because I don't understand, why Mark put the name Abiatar. In fact, the priest at the time was Achimelech. And when Matthew takes up the same story, he leaves out any mention of the priest. This is a huge debate. Many try to harmonize. Others uh, find other explanations. I don't have any explanation of my own. It's a problem in the text. But what I want to look at more is what is Jesus actually saying about the Sabbath? The Sabbath is very central to Jesus' life as described in the books of the gospel. And here again, we have Sabbath. We've had it before, the first entry into the synagogue in Capernaum. And now again, we have this uh, on the Sabbath. The next narrative will be his entry into the synagogue again in Capernaum. Let's look where we've had our Sabbath. So here, Sabbath in the life of Jesus. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, and you'll remember that is the introduction to the cure of the demoniac, the man possessed, Jesus will expel uh, the, the demon. And now here, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. So again, the focus on the Sabbath. And in 3.1, the next narrative that we studied two weeks ago, they watched him. And you remember that malevolent look. They want to catch him. They watched him to see whether he would cure the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. And finally, the last time that we will have uh, a Sabbath before the end is on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And that will be the teaching in the synagogue in Nazareth. We have not reached there but that is a very seminal uh, teaching in the synagogue in Nazareth. Of course, in the end, uh, Jesus will spend the Sabbath in the tomb uh, at the end of the story. I want to spend some time looking at the Sabbath because I've always felt that there is a little bit of misunderstanding when it comes to the Sabbath. The Sabbath is seen as something of the old, the new is making a new order. Let's look again at the text. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath, meaning now we have the Son of Man, we don't need the Sabbath. And I think that that is the wrong interpretation. The Sabbath is an incredible gift. And I'd like to spend these last moments together looking more closely at the Sabbath so that we might come away with a better understanding, not only of what the Sabbath is, but what Jesus is doing on the Sabbath. So often the Sabbath is a time of confrontation in Jesus' ministry because he is doing unexpected things on the Sabbath. Again, remember, the central issue is who is Jesus? Why is he doing what he is doing? The questions are legitimate, but I think that we need to penetrate into the message so that we can understand what is uh, Jesus doing and who is he really. So I want to go right back to the beginning of the Bible. I'm going back to Genesis, the first story of creation and the culmination of creation. Again, I think that we don't often focus properly on what the culmination is. So let's read this. And again, I think that Mark is reflecting on this. Certainly, this would be an integral part of Jesus' teaching. 
Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now, this is an astonishing saying of God. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Of course, we can ask, what is the image and likeness of God? But let's go on. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And I go to, as a jump to come to the end of this day. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And many might say, well, creation has reached its peak, and I will say it has not. It has not. Because creation, this whole story, revolves around seven days, not six days. And so it's very important to continue. In fact, the breakdown of the chapters don't ha doesn't help because we're going over into chapter two. But this is the end of the story. This is the peak. And this is what's written. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. I underline the fact that here we have the first use of the verb, a very important verb in the Pentateuch, and that is he hallowed it, he made it holy. He made that day holy. And I think that that day is a key to understanding what it means to be in the image and likeness of God. We cannot, cre we cannot create. Creating is only for God. It is a verb that is used consistently. Only for God. There is only one exception to that in the epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 2, where that verb is used for Jesus. But Jesus, of course, is God. But what here is the image and likeness that is being fully, fully fulfilled on the seventh day? And that is, we are like God in that Sabbath rest. This is the principle that makes Sabbath so holy for the people of the scriptures. And I would argue in the Old Testament and in the New, I would even say, and this might be a little heretical, we have lost something precious in not having the Sabbath as Sabbath. Let us remember that Sunday has a completely different theological principle. Sunday is the first day of new creation. It is the Sabbath day, the seventh day, when we fully uh, recognize that we are in the image and likeness of God. By the way, I believe, and I think I've said this a little earlier on in these 12 uh, lessons, image and likeness means that we are the children of God. I am in the image and likeness of my father or my mother or both. And I think that that level of meaning is here in the text. But of course, I cannot do what God does in creation. I do what God does on the seventh day. The seventh day is the fulfillment of my vocation to be in the image and likeness of God. So again, very significant. Let us remember that what uh, Jesus is saying in the light of this particular teaching is absolutely true. The Sabbath is given to the Son of Man, the Son of God, is given to the children of God to be the day for perfect communion between the parent God and children humanity as they enter into that identity through the rest on the seventh day. Now I'd like to look at another text about the Sabbath, and this is the text of the Ten Commandments. I'm sure that many of you will remember that the text of the Ten Commandments appears twice in the Pentateuch. 
once in Exodus chapter 20. It's the beginning. The Ten Commandments constitutes the beginning of the giving of the law. The people have arrived at Mount Sinai in chapter 19. They prepare themselves for the meeting with God. I'll stress again, it's the meeting between the child that has just emerged from the Egyptian womb, passed through water and blood to arrive at this moment of meeting with parent God, who is going to give Torah the teaching, the teaching how to live. And these Ten Commandments are separated from the rest of the giving of the Torah, the giving of the teaching, by a simple fact that these words, these 10 words are said directly by God to the entire people. Moses has disappeared. He's brought the people to Mount Sinai. He's fulfilled his mission. It will be after the giving of the 10 words that the people will call him back. And that will be slightly tragic, but we're not learning the Pentateuch right now. What we do want to do is read this first version of the Law of Sabbath. But before I read it, I point out that because that generation that was at Mount Sinai will not enter the land, they will spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness until that generation is dead. And just before they enter the land, Moses does a Deuteronomy. What does Deuteronomy mean? The law again. This is the new generation. They were not at Mount Sinai. And so Moses must repeat the teaching and the Ten Commandments will be repeated. But what is so fascinating is that when it comes to the law of the Sabbath, there is a difference. And I think here, not one replacing the other, but a complementarity is produced. Let's read these two versions in order to get more deeply into the spirituality of the Sabbath which is the spirituality of Jesus, which is the spirituality of the earliest Christian community, and it's a spirituality that is being transmitted by the writers of the books of the gospel. So in Exodus 20, it's written, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and consecrated it. You see there the expressions from Genesis 2. Of course, for those that haven't understood yet, Sabbath means rest. Ah, it says Sabbath day, Yom Shabbat, and he rested Shabbat. That's what it means. The Sabbath day is a day for rest. We'll say in a moment, what does that rest mean? It doesn't mean taking a siesta. We'll talk about that in a moment. But please notice here, the reason for Shabbat, for that day of rest, is to remember that The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and created the human person in God's image and likeness, and rests the seventh day to create that day of communion. It is the day of communion when the human person, like God, rests. So that is an exodus. Now let's look at Deuteronomy. And again, what is created here is a complementarity. Both are absolutely essential. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, it's written, Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male or female slave, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. And now comes the distinction from what's written in Exodus. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, 
Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Now, notice a distinction. One is the memorial of creation, and the other is the memorial of Exodus. Just as you were brought out by God, a people of slaves to be made a free people, so must you institute the freedom that everyone has a day of rest. It's not saying there are no slaves. There are slaves. But there is one day a week which is for everyone a time of communion with God. Slave and free person. Very interesting to remember. They are coming out of Egypt where everyone is slave seven days a week. And one person has Shabbat seven days a week. And that's Pharaoh who thinks he's God. But the society that the people of Israel must build when they go into the land is a society in which Shabbat, and this makes it the absolute heart of the law, Shabbat is the day of communion. Communion, which is vertical between the human person and the creator God. And Shabbat is the day of communion where all humanity is equal in that rest. So again, absolutely central to our understanding of who God is and who we are in the scriptures, Shabbat cannot be set aside. It must be constantly reflected on. So what does it mean that Shabbat, Sabbath, is a day of rest? Again, I don't think it means a day of snoozing, taking the day off and sleeping but rather it is a day of remembrance. And so I'd like to read the psalm that is written especially for the Sabbath. It's Psalm 92, a psalm, a psalm for the Sabbath day. And here is the reason. Here is what we do on Sabbath. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Now, I think, again, this is essential in trying to understand what Jesus is doing on the Shabbat. Why so often does Jesus cure? And I think that it's very important to realize that he's curing not in transgression of the Sabbath. That's what he'll be accused of very often, as he is with the man with the withered hand. But he is curing so that everyone can enter into the song for the Sabbath day, the song of praise. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. And what more reason to give thanks than when a man with a withered hand is healed? One of the stories that I love best that illustrates this is not in the Gospel of Mark, but in the Gospel of Luke, that woman who is bent over. You remember her? She has been bent over for decades. And Jesus says, when he cures her and angers the religious authorities, she's not in a life-threatening situation. Come and cure her on another day of the week. But Jesus answers, no, she's a slave. She's a slave to her disability. She's a slave to that state of being bent over. And how much more will she enter into the song for the Sabbath day if she stands erect? Remember, the church in the Acts of the Apostles is a community that stands erect. It has been cured of its fear. It has been filled with a spirit that makes it a joyful body, giving thanks to the Lord. Yes, indeed, the destiny of humanity is to celebrate a perpetual Sabbath, singing it is good to give thanks to the Lord. This indeed is the scene in the book of Revelation where around the throne they are worshiping constantly. That doesn't mean that they only sit in church and pray. 
but that their whole lives have become a celebration of thanksgiving. So finally, and I'm very glad that we end our this 12 lesson series with this, with this question, why miracles on Sabbath? And I find a parallel in the Old Testament. It's one that we've already talked about. We remember, I hope from earlier lessons, that Jesus in Greek is Joshua. And that Jesus' mission, like Joshua's, is to liberate the land from the powers of darkness that dwell in the land. And so I read a very problematic chapter. Indeed, we can study it one day. I've grappled with this chapter a lot. It's the conquest of Jericho. But what is interesting to note in our context is that that conquest, the first conquest in the land, takes place on the seventh day. Indeed, I think that the text means it's a battle on Shabbat. And it's a battle on Shabbat to liberate the world from the forces of darkness. On the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Again, the Lord has given you the city for salvation. Again, it's a very problematic story with a lot of violence that we struggle with. Those that are interested in reading how the church dealt with it, I strongly recommend the homilies of origin of Alexandria on the book of Joshua. He has a wonderful Christian and Christological reading of that book. So again, I think that what Jesus is doing, and by saying to the Pharisees who are furious that they see some kind of perhaps imagined transgression of the Sabbath, he's not saying the Sabbath is nothing. The Sabbath is not hallowed, blessed, a day of consecration to God, communion with humanity. No, Jesus is not saying that. But what he is saying is that we must be working to restore the image, the likeness of the human person, that image and likeness that allow for communion with God in the Sabbath celebration. This is what the Son of Man has authority over. Yes, even the Sabbath, for the Sabbath itself was given for that communion. And so I end with something that will draw us into the very center of the Gospel of Mark. For the Gospel of Mark has as its physical, theological, and literary center the scenes at the end of chapter 8 and the beginning of chapter 9. At the end of chapter 8, we have Jesus with the disciples next to Caesarea Philippi in that area. And he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, in a moment of greatness, says, you are the Messiah. But then in a moment of doom, refuses to accept that the Messiah will go to the cross. And that Jesus follows with the teaching, anyone who wants to follow me must take up his cross and follow me. But Jesus gives a moment of vision, a moment, a taste of what is to come in what follows at the beginning of chapter 9 at the Transfiguration. And I'd like to end this discussion of Sabbath with that. For Mark says, six days later, six days later means the seventh day, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. I believe the transfiguration is the restoration of image and likeness, that the disciples are able to see that Jesus is the image and likeness of God. But more importantly than that external vision, seeing Jesus as the image and likeness of God, they can recognize there that that is who we are called to be. We are called to be the image and likeness of God. That is the purpose for which we were created as children of God. It is what Jesus comes to restore in us. 
And so with these uh, meditations, these reflections on, again, the opposition to Jesus, the newness breaking in and being rebutted, we want to go back and say, Lord, we want to follow you. We want to be disciples. We need the restoration that you are bringing, for we are sinners loved by God. Okay. Right. Ursula, are we set? There you are. I think now it's the speaker. Great. Okay. Um, Thank you, David. That was uh, very challenging and very interesting. Thank you. Um, Don has put some questions and comments in the chat already. Uh, Was there no holy Sabbath prior to the commandments or exodus, even though the Israel nation um, and religion go back much further than exodus? Yes, a good question. Uh, This is a question that the rabbis deal with a lot. Okay. Um, What uh, happened? How did the people of Israel live before the commandments were given? Now, there are two levels to this question. First is a historical, and we can't answer that. Uh, The text of the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus is an ancient text, but it would seem from a historical, critical point of view that the Sabbath became absolutely central to the people of Israel when they lost the land, when they lost the temple, when they lost a physical space in which they could be in communion with God. And of course, when did that happen? At the time of the Babylonian exile. And it would seem, by reading critically the Pentateuch, and particularly the book of Leviticus, that the focus on the Sabbath becomes a characteristic of the people from the exile onwards. Because, as the great Jewish theologian and and writer says, Abraham Joshua Heschel, the Sabbath is a temple in time. I don't need a space. When that space has been taken away from me because I'm in exile, uh, I can have that day of communion wherever wherever I am. So again, uh, I'm not sure we can answer the question, how did the people live before Exodus? Because we don't know anything historical about the people. The texts that are being written, the narratives that are being woven, are a reflection on the past, but very much written for the present and the future. Thank you. Uh, Don then comments, uh, perhaps what Jesus is demonstrating is that the Sabbath is the day to put things, both physical and spiritual, right, both inside of ourselves and amongst the people we come into contact with. Yes, I would say yes, absolutely but with the caution that we need to prepare for the Sabbath and a lot of that putting right, particularly when it has to do with our relations with others, should be done before the Sabbath so that we can come into the communion, the communion that is vertical and horizontal, the communion that is with God and with community, so that it is a day of celebration. Because we don't succeed to do that, Jesus does the miracles that he does in order to really respect the Sabbath as consecrated time. Um, John asks, uh, how could we as Christians today celebrate Sabbath? So that is an excellent question and one that we deal with a lot. I'll point out that when Pope Benedict XVI became Pope, if you go back and look at his homily, I think it was for the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, the 1st of May, He spoke about the importance of retrieving a sense of Sabbath. And I think that there what he is referring to is our addiction to work. Okay, in our societies that are so focused on succeeding and making more money and getting more successes, we don't rest and we lose our humanity. And I would add Uh, What I refer to as humanity there is that divine spark in us. And I think that Pope Benedict was referring to that. So should we keep Saturday as Sabbath? No, not necessarily. I think that we can combine the celebration of the resurrection with the celebration of Sabbath. I grew up in South Africa and then left. And I remember 
people felt not always very happy that in South Africa of my youth, uh, there was no entertainment on, on Sunday. Uh, there was kind of a Calvinist ethic. And I'm not saying that something should be imposed of that in that spirit. But I think that that was a genuine attempt to make sure that we do have a time when we are free in order to focus on God and focus on community. So I'd say, yes, maybe not. Uh, the, in the Jewish tradition, there is a developed sense of what is work, what is not work. And there are 39 types of work that you're not permitted to do. I'm not saying that we need necessarily to go there. But I think we do need to realize that that is a very significant way of trying to live uh, God's commandment of a day that is consecrated to communion with God and communion with one another. Um, Bernadette says, thank you very much for the depth um, and the spirituality that you've offered us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, Don, I like the thought that it is only when we rest and meditate on the Sabbath, we are alike God. In all other respects, he is almighty. Yes. Great. Mm. Great. Terence, uh, in your exposition of Mark, you make a strong link between the author and Paul. How contested is this view and why? Okay, so I think that this question has come up before. And again, I don't want to get defensive and apologetic. Okay, many people say that the, the uh, literary, the, the verbal, uh, the literal similarities between these two authors is not sufficient to make out a claim that Mark is a disciple of Paul. What I'm doing, okay, and I think that's the freedom I have as a reader, is I'm sensing so many echoes in the theological foci, okay? One of the most central, I remind you, was in the idea of kenosis, of Jesus fully emptying himself of divinity, which reaches its peak in the cross. Uh, how can God die on the cross unless God is completely emptying himself of all divinity? And so that is a major theme. But I think that there are many other themes like the one I pointed out tonight. I'm not sure that you are convinced by it. Um, I think Terence is asking this question, right? But I think that's for each of you to, to, to take up and, and see whether, whether it speaks to you. Again, I find reading Romans alongside uh, Mark is a very, very helpful exercise. I think Mark illuminates a lot of complexities in Paul's theological thought. And I think that the, the times that Paul's theological thought breaks through with this incredible insight into who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in our lives uh, gets translated into narrative form by Mark. Okay. In fact, I'll give you another exercise, Terence, if you want, and that is uh, to recognize that the transfiguration, Mark's description of the transfiguration, which is as central to the narrative as the cross is, that transfiguration is written by Paul as the experience we must have. We are called to be transfigured in the epistle to the Romans, for example. And the text is the beginning of chapter 12. Again, sometimes the translation doesn't help us, but there where in Romans we find the word transformed, we must be transformed in this encounter uh, with, with Jesus. The word is in fact transfigured. We must be transfigured uh, in that encounter. So again, I'm finding these echoes more on the level of the profound understanding of Paul about who Jesus is being translated into a narrative that really parallels Paul's theological reflections in the Gospel of Mark. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Circuit 115. I'm not sure who that is. Um, but could you share some links between the Sabbath uh, rest communion of the Trinity and the rest of Jesus' 
in the grave after his earthly work. Sorry, and circuit one one five is Rebecca. So just <laughs> read it again. Could you share some links between the Sabbath, uh, Sabbath rest, communion of the Trinity, and the rest of Jesus in the grave after his earthly work? So it's a fascinating question, and I have the sense, Rebecca, that you've worked on this yourself. We don't have time to go into it. I invite you to write to me. Uh, you can get my email through the through the Institute. I do want to say one thing, though, and that is that Holy Saturday, okay, you, you are you there referring to Jesus in the tomb, okay? Holy Saturday is the one moment where we as Christians are really supremely aware of what Sabbath should be. It's a day spent in profound prayer, okay? It's not a day to take a, to take a siesta. It's a day really to reflect on the work of God, to search out the mystery of who God is in our lives. So that is indeed uh, one day in the year. I would love that to be spread out uh, once a week that we have such a day. And I think that it would add enormously to the depth of our spiritual lives. Um, Errol asks, what are your views of essential services, such as nurses, doctors, police officers, etc., who work on the Sabbath? So again, uh, I want to stress that I'm not suggesting that everyone needs to take Saturday off and make it Sabbath. Okay. What I'm more reflecting on is the absolute necessity for everyone, including doctors and nurses, to have a time that is really quality time spent with God and community. I remember there the Exodus Deuteronomy. Okay, Sabbath is not just a time to go off on retreat, the top of a mountain, and spend time with God. That's blessed and wonderful. I recommend it highly. But the special nature of the Sabbath is that it's a community, a community coming together uh, and resting together in God. So, uh, and again, I don't think Okay, again, I hesitate to say this because some people might find it a little offensive. I don't find going to Sunday Mass for 45 minutes, going in and getting out as fast as possible, is what we mean by Sabbath. Okay, it's great. Please don't stop doing it. It's wonderful. But it's not what we're referring to when God consecrates, hallows a day, a day to break away from everything that takes us in every direction of work and, and achievement and uh, domination. It's really a day to be a child of God with other children of God. Hmm. I think that's a good place to stop it, unless there's any more urgent questions that anybody would like to pose. I wouldn't open that because I've been told by we some that we're going into load shedding and it's Right, eight o'clock. Oh, it's going to get dark. And I'd like to say just a word, uh, because this is the last time that we meet in this present series, to say that um, the secretary of the, our, it's not a secretary, Ursula Gillian, Gillian, who is mm -hmm. our, what is she? She's our social media coordinator. Social media coordinator, essential person here in the Institute, will be sending out a questionnaire in order to ask your opinion about not whether this was wonderful or awful, but rather, and that you can express as well, but rather, should we continue and in what format? Uh, that, that is the question. So it will not be continued immediately because I now have a series of travels and, and teachings, but um, you'll have the opportunity to say that was perfectly fine, it was great, but that's enough, or we would like to continue. And even what would you like to continue with? Uh, we've reached in 12 lectures, chapter 3, verse 6. Okay, I will say that I think it was Gillian who, when I proposed doing 12 lectures on Mark, she said, that's great. I uh, will finish Mark and then we can do Luke and John and Matthew. And I said, Gillian, I think <laughs> that 12 lectures will just be beginning Mark. But of course, uh, the evaluation will be your opportunity to say whether you'd like such a thing to continue and in what form. So I'd like to say thank you very much. I do want to stress uh, that there are people who have been engaging me outside of this forum about what I've been saying, and just the opportunity to go over the material again 
I feel that I've learned an incredible amount since we began 12 weeks ago. And my hope is that I, you might be encouraged also to look at Mark as a great theologian, a great writer, and a great spiritual guide. So thank you very much. And I hope to see you somewhere, somehow, in some place. God bless. Thank you very much, David. And before everybody goes, just a reminder that the Winter Living Theology series is coming up in July, August, and September. Please watch our adverts for it. And David will be giving us some more of his wisdom and sharing his knowledge about the scriptures and his love of the scriptures. So we look forward to to welcoming you to our Winter Living Theology as well. And it won't be Mark. So those of you who are bored, feel free to come because it won't be Mark. Thank you. Lots of thank yous in the chat. And thank you all.